Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word now, we pray that you, by your spirit, might search our hearts. And that in these next minutes, under your word, we might be dealt with by you. That you might so deal with us that our lives are changed deeply and permanently. For your glory and honor. Amen. As you uh, probably know, Caroline and I often nip over to Spain, thanks to Ryanair. And about a year or so ago, we were there, lovely, hot uh, summer's evening, balmy, walking along the seafront. We heard some music playing, some nice music, lively music playing. So we followed our ears and we went to where there was a, a big uh, square surrounded by trees and there was a stand in it of uh, different tiers with lots and lots of musicians on these uh, stands playing this lively music and there were people there just doing a little dance and they, they would be uh, very very simple they'd be holding their hands in circles various circles of people and they would be just moving their feet a little bit in one way and then the other way and then they would seem to do the same thing with their hands up in the air and then they'd repeat it all with their hands down very very simple but the interesting thing was that anyone could join in you just go up to the circle and they break the circle and join you in and you come and then when they all go this way and you go that way, they all laugh at you and help you know we're going this way a bit and they encourage you and you learn to join in the dance with everybody else. And it was such a joyful, happy occasion and I thought that's really what Lansdowne Baptist Church should be like. Not that we dance around in circles in our services, although some of you might like that, but that but that we welcome people in. And they, they just come and join in with us as we're worshipping God, as we're living for the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't say to them, no, you don't fit in. It doesn't matter what age they are, what colour they are, what size they are, what background they, they come from. They're, everybody's welcome to join in. And when people make mistakes, we don't chuck them out. We say to them, go on, do it this way. So next time they do it better. And we encourage each other. And I thought... That's such a good picture of what the Christian church should be like. Welcoming people in and help them to live for the glory of God. The problem is, it's a lot more difficult to welcome people into the church of Jesus Christ and to encourage them to live for Jesus Christ than it is to get people just to join the circle and do a little jig in the uh, town centre. D.L. Moody once said it, it takes 1% of effort to get people converted and 99% to bring them to maturity. Uh, and our problem is that we're not just trying to encourage people who seem to be shoppers in Bournemouth to come in and do a jig. But we're trying to encourage people who are in their minds hostile to God. And in their souls dead to the things of God. And we want them to come alive and to love the things of God. And humanly speaking, that is impossible. We cannot do it, but it's got to be done. And then these people who by God's supernatural grace do get saved, we want them to start living for God in this world. And they come with so many scars and so much baggage and they come into a congregation which has uh, traditions and everything else. It's so difficult and we've got to work so hard. So hard to get people saved and so hard to bring people to maturity. But we've got to do it. And here in Colossians chapter 4, in verses 2 to 6, Paul says we've got to reach the people. And in verses 7 to 17, he says we've got to teach the people. This is it. This is what we've got to do. We've got to be reaching and teaching the people. First of all, verses 2 to 6, we've got to win the world. Now, how do we do that? As I've said, they're hostile in their minds and they're dead spiritually. How can we win them? Well, there's only one way to do it. And there's always been just this one way. Go back 600 years before Christ. Go to Babylon, go to the Kibar River, and you'll see a, a, a priest 
acting as a prophet in his 30s, Ezekiel. And there he is, and he has a vision. And in his vision, he sees a valley. And this valley is full of bones, dead bones, dry bones. They've been dead for years. They've been baked by the sun. And they're scattered all over the place. And God says to him, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel gives the very profound answer. You know, Lord. (laughs) Obviously correct, but doesn't help. And God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to the wind, prophesy to the spirit. And then God tells Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones, preach to the dead people. And as Ezekiel prophesies to the wind and prophesies to the dead bones, as he prays to God and as he preaches to people, so something happens. There's a rattling, there's a stirring, there's a movement. And these dead bones start to live. And that valley of dry bones is transformed into an army of the living God. Because of what? Because he prophesied to the wind and prophesied to the dead bones. Go to the days of the apostles. Listen to the apostle Peter speaking on behalf of all the apostles. And he says, we must give ourselves to prayer and to the preaching of the word of God. And as these men gave themselves to praying to God and preaching to dead bones, they turned the world upside down. Or go back before Ezekiel, even before King David, to the times of Samuel. Samuel anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. And the people rejected Samuel, and he found that very difficult to cope with. But he struggled through obeying the Lord. And the time came when uh, Saul had been recognized as king in 1 Samuel chapter 12. And in 1 Samuel chapter 13, Samuel gives his farewell discourse. And do you know what he says to the people in 1 Samuel chapter 12 and about verse 29? He says, God forbid that I should sin against him by ceasing to pray for you. And I will teach you the word of God. He says, although I've been rejected by you, I'm I'm not going to stop praying. That would be a sin. And I'm not going to stop teaching you the word of God. Because the only way that dead bones live is by praying to God. And preaching to people. And here in Colossians chapter 4 and verses 2 to 6, the Apostle Paul explains that this isn't just the job of apostles and prophets. This is the job of every single believer. Every single one of us has the responsibility to pray and to evangelize. If you look at Colossians chapter 4 verses 2 to 4, We're to be devoted to prayer, and then verses 5 and 6, to be disciplined in evangelism. So first of all then, verses 2 to 4, we must be devoted to prayer. I don't know if you've heard of John Hyde, known as Praying Hyde, missionary to India. I have had two biographies of him on my shelves, which... Uh, have gone walkies. If your conscience is pricked, very good. But they weren't on my shelves. And as I was looking yesterday, I was saying, hide, where are you hiding? (laughs) But I couldn't find the uh, biographies to uh, read you the stories exactly. But he had a phenomenal ministry of prayer. He started off praying for his mission that God would give them one person to be converted every day through the year. And that happened. So the next year, he prayed for two people to be converted every day during the year. And that happened. Now, this wasn't just a little prayer at the beginning of the year. Oh, Lord, may 700 people be saved this year. This was praying day in and day out, day and night, for God's blessing upon the mission. And it happened. So the next year, he prayed for four people every day to be converted. He prayed so hard, the doctors actually said that his heart moved a little bit from his chest because of, sideways because of the earnestness of his intercession. But there's an interesting story about John Hyde in the biography of J. Wilbur Chapman. 
Chapman was an evangelist who worked with D.L. Moody and in 1906 started doing his own evangelistic campaigns around the world. And he was in this city and he was having a very difficult time. He had been preaching for several nights and there had been no fruit, no success to his preaching at all. No one was showing interest in the things of God. And then there was a knock on his door. And it was John Hyde, praying Hyde, who said that he was just passing through this town and he felt that God stir his heart, that he should stop and he should pray for Wilbur Chapman's uh, preaching. And, and so there and then they got down on their knees in Chapman's office and Chapman said it was incredible. He had never heard praying like that in his life. He said they, they stayed there for maybe five minutes and said nothing. But he was so conscious of, of God's presence coming near and, and of the sweat coming on his face. And then praying Hyde unburdened himself with prayer. And, and the passion of his praying was something that Chapman had never experienced in his life before. That night, John Chapman preached and 25 people were converted. And every night for the rest of the two weeks of that mission, he knew a dozen or so people converted every night because God hears and answers prayers when we are devoted to prayer. But we can't all pray like praying hide. We're not all gifted in that way, just the same as we can't all preach like Billy Graham, so we can't all pray like praying hide. But we can pray. We can start to pray and we can encourage ourselves to pray and we can pull our prayers and God will hear and answer. So we must be devoted to prayer. And we see two things in verses 2 to 4. We see, first of all, in verse 2, that there's got to be the right commitment. There's got to be the right commitment. It, Paul doesn't say, make sure you pray before you go to sleep at night. He doesn't say, make sure you don't forget to pray. He doesn't say, say the Lord's Prayer every day. He says, be devoted to prayer. Be devoted to prayer. And I think we will be devoted to prayer if we understand its importance. If we think we can do without prayer, then we won't pray much. But if we understand the importance of prayer, then we will start not only to be devoted to prayer, but to be frightened not to pray. Do you remember the last time I preached to you before I went on holiday? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? How he said to his disciples, watch and pray, or you will fall into temptation. And the truth is, if we're not praying, we will be falling into temptation. The devil will be getting his teeth into our lives. Prayer is vital. But have you noticed uh, when Paul talks about the armor of God, when he's talking about the spiritual battle, he says our great weapon in the spiritual battle is prayer. Above all, prayer. If we're going to win in the spiritual battle, we've got to pray. If we're going to stop losing, we've got to pray. If we win, we're going to pray. Indeed, if you read the scriptures, if you read church history, you will find that every great work of God has been born through prayer, has been bathed in prayer. Read the story of George Muller and the orphanages there in Bristol, and you'll see how in answer to prayer, Hundreds of thousands of pounds, indeed 1.6 million pounds, came in to provide for the orphans back in the 19th century. And God built his work in answer to prayer. Or read Hudson Taylor and the work of the OMF. Go and see those great OMF buildings which were provided for in answer to prayer. And they're just, as it were, a headquarters for the work that spread through the whole of inland China and now throughout the world. And thank God for what he does in answer to prayer. Without prayer, we sin. Prayer is that weapon. Prayer is what God works through to build his church. And indeed, if we remember the words of Samuel, that it is a sin not to pray for God's people. And I think when we understand the importance of this, then we will be devoted to to prayer. We will make sure that every day we put time aside for prayer. We will make sure, as Jesus said, we go into uh, the room, close the door, get alone with God and pray to him who sees and hears what is done in secret. It won't be that we just, you know, think about things and kind of daydream prayers during the day. Nothing wrong with that. But we will get 
serious about praying to God. It may start with just 10 minutes a day, but we will write in our diary, we are going to spend time to pray. We're going to be devoted to prayer. We'll never win the world, never win anybody, if we're not devoted to prayer. There's got to be that commitment to prayer, but secondly, there's got to be the right content to our prayer, verses 2 to 4. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. What does he mean when he says being watchful? Does he mean you shouldn't close your eyes when you pray? <laughs> no, what he means is you've got to be looking around to see those things you need to be praying for. Keep your eyes open. Find out missionary information that you should be praying about. Use your church news sheet at the back and the prayer diary and things to pray about. I keep lots of lists. I have a list for every day of the week. I have lists of all the members of the church. I have lists of all the ministries of the church. And then I write my own list of things that I can think about then. So that when I go to pray, I'm not forgetting things. I want to be watchful. Being watchful and thankful. Never go to God with a list of complaints. Never go to God to grumble. Always go there thankful. We should be a thankful people because we are richly blessed and wonderfully saved. And then Paul says, pray for evangelists. He says, pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I ought, as I should. Paul says, pray for me. Pray for two things. Pray for the opportunity to preach and for the ability to preach the, the, the message. He says, pray, pray for an open door for our message. Isn't that incredible? Do you know where Paul was when he wrote that? Gives you a clue. For which I am in chains, their second to bottom line. He was in prison. He was in a disgusting Roman jail. He was in chains, which chafed his wrists and his ankles and they said the worst thing about prison was the chains because when one person moved everybody got dragged with the chains you couldn't sleep at night you couldn't move during the day he was in this disgusting jail he was chained the, the food was meager the sanitation was non-existent the, the uh, treatment was hostile at best and he was in this horrible hole of a roman jail and he says pray for an open door Pray for an open door that I can escape. No. Isn't that incredible? When he's in jail, he says, pray for an open door for the message. He says, there are these people who come to be my guards. Pray that I might have an opening so that I can communicate with them. There are people who come and throw some rotten cabbages to us once a day. Pray that I might have an opportunity to speak to them. Pray for an open door for the message. It's so important we pray for people in prison and pray for people in hospital and pray for people in awkward situations. But let's pray most of all that through them the message might spread. And let's make sure we pray for those who are evangelists. Pray for the Roger Carswells and the Rico Tices. Pray for Motsi. Pray for me that we might proclaim this message that God would give us an opening, that he would give us an opportunity. Pray for the students in their university, Freshers Week, mission coming up next month, pray that they might have an open door. Let's pray for th those who are young mums who meet other mums at the school gates, that they'll have this opening to speak about the gospel. Let's pray for those who go into the care homes, that they'll have opportunities to speak to the residents and the staff. Let's pray for this open door. You know, it's so difficult, isn't it? We find we want to evangelize, but it's so hard, we can hardly even see our neighbors. We can't get into the blocks of flats. There's so much against us. What we need is for God to give us an open door, that through that door, the message would come with power to the people. So we pray for an open door for the message. And verse 4, we pray for enabling to preach it. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. It's so difficult. We have to persuade people that God exists, 
that God is holy, that they are unholy, that they are unfit for God. Indeed, God is angry at their sin every day. That Jesus Christ is God who became man, who died, that they might be reconciled to God. That there is no other way, that there's nothing they can do, nothing they can say, nothing they can give, nothing they can pay so they can get right with God. It's all been done by Jesus Christ. And they receive it as a free gift from God the moment they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And we have to explain this to people. Now, it's so clear to us, but it's so foreign to them. It's foreign to everything they experience. They believe that they should pay for it, or they should try and make themselves good enough. They believe that they get saved by living, you know, decent lives. It's so difficult, and so we got to be clear in the way we present the gospel. So pray not only for an open door, but for clarity, for ability. Because if people don't understand the gospel, they can't believe the gospel. So we must be devoted to prayer. We're never going to go forward unless we're devoted to prayer. What is the most important meeting in the life of this church? It's the prayer meeting. Everything else flows from that. It's the powerhouse of the church. What's the most important thing you can do for the work of the church here? It's to get down on your knees and to plead with God in secret. We've got to be devoted to prayer. But we have also got to be disciplined in evangelism. William Sprague wrote, uh, preached a series of sermons on revival, and they've been published as lectures in revival, and they are very good. And he says something very interesting in one of his lectures. He says that there are some people who don't believe enough in the work of the Holy Spirit. And so they never pray. They just get on and try to do everything in their own strength. He said there are other people who believe too much in the work of the Holy Spirit. So they just pray and leave it for God to do it. You know, dear Lord, please bless everybody in Bournemouth. Amen. Expect God to do it instantly and see no responsibility to go and evangelize themselves. And he said, we've got both. We have the power of the Holy Spirit and the responsibilities that have been given to us. So we pray to God, but we've also got to be disciplined in evangelism. And we're told two things. First of all, in verse 5, we must make the most of every opportunity. He says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. One of the things that gives me continual regret, feelings of guilt, is when I was at Bible college, I used to be out preaching every Sunday, and I used to keep one Sunday free to um, come home, see my mum, get my washing done, get some good <laughs> cooking in, in my stomach, those kind of things. And I, I kept it right in the middle of the term. Two weeks before that Sunday, I was preaching up in Shepshed, and they said, oh, you're back with us in two weeks. I said, no, no, four weeks. They said, no, no, we've got something else in four weeks. You're here in two weeks. Well, fortunately, I could change. So I went and preached at Shepshed in two weeks, and I went home to Somerset four weeks later. I left college very early, before lunch on the Friday. I got someone to drive me to the underground. I got straight on the underground, straight to Paddington, straight down to Taunton, bus straight down to Wivaliscombe. I got home incredibly early that Friday afternoon, and I walked in, and my mum said that my great-aunt Mimi, an American relative who'd been living with us for about ten years, had had a heart attack that day. I suddenly realized why God had brought me home so early that Friday afternoon. Because my great aunt Mimi, a lovely person, came to church but just nominally Christian. And I had an opportunity to talk to her about the state of her soul when she was at that crisis time, just having had a heart attack. So I quickly had a cup of tea and I walked up into her bedroom and I went in and I sat on the chair and I looked at her and she looked so well. I thought, there's no way I can talk to her about death and eternity now. I mean, there's no way I can. So it was just nice to her and I didn't say anything. I went downstairs, half an hour later she had another heart attack and was dead. I felt the Lord had brought me all the way back to see her. 
impressed upon my conscience. And that's why he built me back. And I'd missed the opportunity. I wonder what the consequences of missing that opportunity were. So, about ten years later, when I was a minister in Chesterfield, and I got a phone call one Monday tea time from a lady who I hardly knew. She'd been brought up in a Christian home, but she'd married a non-Christian, and that 30 years of marriage to a non-Christian had devastated anything uh, of the Christian in her life. But her father-in-law, non-Christian, was dying. And she was worried that he was going to die without hearing the gospel. So she rang me up and asked if I would go to the hospital and share the gospel with him. So I went straight to the hospital. He was so desperately ill. He was lying on his bed and he had oxygen up his nose. And he, he, he could just lie there. He could hardly open his eyes. He, he was clearly dying in his death throes. And so I went there and I held his hand. I told him who I was. And I wondered, what do I do? I don't want to abuse him. I don't want to take advantage of the situation. But I didn't want to miss the opportunity this time. So I said to him, I, I, I said, Bill, I said, your daughter has rung me up and asked that I would come and tell you what the gospel is. So I stood beside him. And I explained the gospel to him, that God was the creator who was holy, who had created us in his image so we could have a relationship with him. But because of our sin, we'd gone away. But Jesus Christ had, had come so that our sins could be dealt with and that we could come back and be in a right relationship with God. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this man who'd been here all the time suddenly started his whole body went into urging, uh, uh, as if he was calling out. So the only thing he could do was, when I said everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, there on his deathbed he was crying out. And I felt such a sense of God dealing with him that I prayed with him and I went home and I heard that in the middle of that night he passed into eternity. And I believe he passed into glory because there, on his deathbed, he cried out to God. And when I took his funeral the next week, I was so glad that I had made the most of that opportunity. Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. Indeed, he tells us to be wise in the way we act towards outsiders because that will create opportunities. If we live wise, if we live the Christian way, people will come and ask us and there will be these opportunities. But he tells us in verse 6, not only are we to make the most of every opportunity, but in verse 6, we are to make the most of non-opportunities as well. You see, life is not made up of these wonderful opportunities every 10 minutes. These opportunities come once in a while. But every day, we've got to let our conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that we may know how to answer everyone. Every day we've got to be making the most of the opportunities. Always full of grace. Always humble. Never arrogant. Never talking to these unconverted people and talking down at them and making them feel silly. But always being gracious. We are humble. We are concerned. We're loving. Always full of grace. Seasoned with salt. Our words are, are full of grace so that they don't reject us. And our words are seasoned with salt to make their mouth water, to make them want more. You know what McDonald's do? They put this salt on their chips, don't they, so that people eat them and then want more. Well, our conversation is to be seasoned with salt. So we just sow a seed here, sow a thought there to raise that interest so that people want to know more. This is why it's important that we read Christian books. But this is why it's important we listen to the sermons that moxie has been preaching on Sunday nights, dealing with people's barriers to faith, so that we can sow the seed, so that we make the most of non-opportunities, always full of grace, always seasoned with salt. I have a friend, he's been a banker for many years, up in Leeds, he'd been in the block of... Uh, tower block where the, uh, uh, they worked for about a year and a half and he got in a lift someone came in the lift and said to him you go to church 
I want to come to church with you. Well, there was a week's mission on in Pontefract at that time. Before they got to the bottom of the building in the lift, they'd organized for that person to come to church that night. By the end of the week, he and his wife had been converted. In the next month, their daughters had been converted. He is now an elder of a church in Leeds. But this guy's life was just consistent. So suddenly, someone spoke to him. Let your conversation always be full of grace. Well, that's how to win the world. Time has gone. My second point was uh, care for converts in verses 7 to 17. There's so many hurt people. If God's going to save people, if we're going to uh, win the world, we've got to care for people when they are saved. And Paul uh, lists here greetings from different people. First of all, verses 7 and 9. Teachers who will encourage your hearts, and we have to be committed to being teachers, whether it's a small groups, whether it's working in care homes, whether it's youth work, Sunday school, those who are gifted as teachers, let's do the work of teaching because people need to be taught. Secondly, comforters, verses 10 and 11. Aristarchus was Paul's fellow prisoner. Do you know why? They weren't arrested together. They weren't tried together and thrown into prison together. Aristarchus heard that Paul was in prison and said, I want to help him. Okay, I'll go and live in prison with him. I'll be his fellow prisoner. And I'll go and live and sleep and eat in that stinking, rotten, disgusting Roman jail. I'll be treated as a prisoner so that I can give some support to Paul. Well, that's comforting, isn't it? You know, that's, that's what it means to be a comforter, to come alongside people. So the Holy Spirit just comes alongside us. He's the comforter. And Paul talks about all these people have proved a comfort to him. Now, we thank God for the PCT that works so hard, bringing comfort to people here. But we've all got to be doing the work. We've all got to be coming alongside people, comforting people. In the church this side, they'll be hurting people, lonely people people with problems, and they will get missed if we aren't all doing the work of comforting one another. We need teachers, we need comforters, and thirdly, intercessors. Verses 12 and 13, Epaphras is always wrestling in prayer. He's a kind of praying hide, and there are some people who God has given a special ministry of intercession to, and there will be people who won't be able to get out to the service this evening because of age or infirmity, but if you go and knock on their door, do you know what you'll find them doing at half past six till half past seven? You'll find them pleading with God for his blessing upon the work here because they are wrestling in prayer for the church, and not just for us, but for other churches as well. And then finally, verses 14 to 16, there are Paul's friends. And do you know, we need everybody who comes in here to find friends, people who will pray for them, people who will comfort them, and people who will teach them, so that they become strong, so that they become healthy, and so that they, in turn, become servants of God. So we need not only to win the world, but to care for the converts. Indeed, Paul ends in verse 17 by saying, Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. We have received, you have, I have, we have received a work from the Lord. Are you doing it? Are you completing it? Are you going to complete it? Don't give up. Let's do the work he's given us to do and complete it. And we thank God that Jesus Christ completed the work he came to do to save us. And we'll think about that in a second. But just before we do that, we're going to sing the hymn, Filled with Compassion for All Creation. Jesus came into a world that was lost. Stir us to action. Filled with your passion for all the people who live on the earth. Let's stand and sing.